Thank you very much. Uh, is this thing on? Can you hear me? Oh, that's, that's all right. Right. Um, yeah, I literally finished writing my slides about 20 minutes ago. So, so, so they've been well practiced, well rehearsed. I, I, I might finish in five minutes. We might be here at five o'clock still. I, I apologize either way. Uh, it, yeah, I kind of sold it as a red team talk when I suggested it, but it's not really. I, out of interest, uh, how many people in the room would self-identify as red team testers? Well, nobody. <laughs> Who, who's ever picked a lock on a red team job? Really? Okay. We will see. Um, right, so, who am I? What the hell are we doing? Uh, I, I think I promised them four things. So, so some history, some, some science, some, some stories, which, which I think are funny. Um, you may or may not, and, and some interesting pictures. But before we get the fun stuff, I will talk a bit about who the hell I am. Uh, so, my name is Steve. I've been doing this shit far too long. Um, I, I, like, child of the 80s, well, 70s technically, grew up in the 80s, so lots of, like, 8-bit computers, lots of 16-bit computers, lots of um, defeating copy protection for academic purposes um, and, and personal interest. Uh, then I got sidetracked. Oh, sorry, I, I want to be a forensic pathologist, so I, I like dealing with dead things. Um, I, I got sidetracked in YT, ended up doing pen testing and forensics and incident response and research and development and system administration. Um, and, and now I, I guess people ask me what I do for a living and I, I say as little as I can possibly get away with. Uh, we, we were trying to come up with another rhyming name for the, the bottom of the, that's, that's a t-shirt I had printed. Uh, the, the only sensible suggestion from one of my colleagues was sex attacker, which I, I don't think is fair. <laughs> if, if anybody has any better ideas, you know, feel free. Um, I blatantly stole this slide from my friend Nick, who isn't here, um, so I can't take credit. I am an award-winning speaker. Well, that, that's my award. You can tell, thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be recognised. You can tell it's a good award because it lights up. And it's a better colour than his because I got to pick. The fact I was on the committee at this event had nothing to do with it. Um, I didn't vote for my own talk. Uh, so I've, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I, I live in a, an area of natural beauty, uh, roughly halfway between Hereford and Cheltenham. And if you know anything about the Ministry of Defence and the government, that will give you an idea of why I've ended up the mess that I am. Um, so, it, I mean, it's funny. I, I, I'm not here to talk about work. I work for a large telecoms firm. Um, and I talk to security people who, who care about business and money, and, and I don't get any of that because I, I care about security and, and none of the rest of it which is why I don't really fit in. Uh, it's, I, I have been called many things. Um, perhaps the nicest was by Haroon at 44Con a, a couple of years back. Um, when, when, when we, we may have trolled him slightly the night before he gave his keynote about what a waste of time defensive stuff is and why bother and everything's broken and we're all going to die and it's a pointless waste of time. Um, I, I know which one I am. I said, so my friend Mr. K, uh, used to run Full Disclosure, one of the most talented people I've ever known. So, so if it's pinky in the brain, I, I know which one I am. So I, I tweet stuff. I'm on Twitter if you want to, if you want to look at me there. Uh, I'm not here to talk about work, so I'm not going to. Um, some, some of you know what I do for a living. Some of you don't. Uh, yeah, I, I do security stuff. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. Right. Big caveat and, and disclaimer. Uh, I, I am not a locksmith. I have never been a locksmith. I hold no locksmithing qualifications. I, I, I've read some books and I've, I've looked at some videos and I've played with some stuff, but I am not an actual locksmith. Do anything I say is probably rubbish. Ignore it, discount it, go and watch some interesting talks. Or better still, go to the pub. I, I can't believe you're all in here. I'd be in the pub if I wasn't doing this. But yeah, so I'm, I'm not a locksmith. I, this, this is just stuff I think or know or have looked at. Um, do not take my word for it. I, I also, there's also a sort of secret is that I'm not actually very good at lock picking. In fact, I'm terrible at lock picking. And, and yet I, give talks and stuff because you don't actually need to know a lot. It's like martial arts. I, I'm interested in studying martial arts. I, I don't train in martial arts. And it's like this stuff. I, I know all the theory. I, I don't practice enough. Um, right, anyway, that's me. What? Since I'm here, so I was staying in Manchester a while ago. It was 2015. Now, I'm in a hotel and my room is underground. It's, it's like not even, they don't even have windows. And there's a, there's a nice notice on the, the, the door saying that for my reassurance, that they, they fit spy holes and safety chains. It's like, what the hell has gone in here in the past? <laughs> and, you know, they'll phone me up if I order any food, which, which looking at the state of the place, I'm not convinced I am. But we'll, ju just to see if you're awake and, and thinking and can think on my sort of level, we're, we're going to play a quick game of spot the security issue. Uh, I, I wish I had prizes to give away, but I don't. So can anybody tell me? What's up with that? <laughs> C congratulations, you two can do physical pen testing. Um, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm not just a pen tester, I'm a consultant. 
So, so I come up with a solution. Um, it's, a, it's a temporary one, I'll give you that, but it, it kept me safe for the night. Um, but yeah, my, what, Manchester hotels, what they, I don't, I don't get it. Um, I didn't have a screwdriver, so I couldn't fix the problem. Um, but like I say, temporary fix did. Right, so what, what, why am I here? I ask myself again. I keep saying I'm not going to volunteer for stuff, and, and yet here I am. Uh, so I'm, I am going to talk about history, but not in the sense of here is a history of locks and lock picking and, and, and all that stuff. I'm, I'm going to talk about history of me because I'm more interested in me than anybody else is probably. Uh, so I was young once. Um, I less tattoos. Uh, so this is sometime in the late 90s. Uh, this is at a gathering of like-minded individuals near where I live. Um, and the, the, the blurry-faced man pictured with me is a very good friend of mine, um, who I shall call Metaphor for the purposes of this, as we're going by nicknames and not real names. Uh, and we worked in some office, and he had a bunch of lockpicks on his desk. So one day, I'm like, well, you clearly are. I can see you. That's all right. Help yourself. I, I want half the money, though. That's, that's fair. Um, so yeah, so, so you had this thing, uh, make all knowledge empirical. You know, if, if you want to know something, like play with it, experiment with it. Don't take somebody else's word for it, do it yourself. So you had these lockpicks on his desk, I'm like, what are they for? They're lockpicks. What do you do with them? You pick locks. How? Uh, go and play with them. Here, have them, take them away. And back then, you know, it's, we worked in office environment, so what are we looking at opening? I, I became very well known as the man who can get you into your filing cabinet when you leave your keys at home. Which, which happened like every other day, every few days, somebody would turn up, no keys. Can you come and open the filing cabinet? And yet, yes, of course I can. Filing cabinets are rubbish. They have terrible locks. Uh, what I now know is that they're all based on wafer locks. Uh, these are what wafer locks look like internally. Well, externally and the bits that are on the inside. Uh, they're not designed to be highly secure. They're designed to be cheap to mass produce. Um, so they're, they're terrible locks, but they're cheap and they're better than nothing. So they, they sort of serve a purpose. And, and you know, I'm, I, I like locks because they're really simple, like me. I like the, not much to them. You know, it's, it's a simple thing. You've got you've got a plug which goes into a cylinder and will rotate if there's nothing blocking it, like when you've got the right key in it. But if you lock it without the key, it's got bits of metal protruding, won't turn. Simple, right? That's you know, even I can understand that. Uh, and if you think about a key, a key basically serves two functions. The, the key. Like lifts whatever the internal mechanism of the lock is, be it pins or wafers or whatever, and then you use it physically as a lever to turn the lock. Now, obviously, if, if we had one tool that would let us lift the things to the right height and turn it, we'd have the key, and we wouldn't need to be picking locks. But, but we don't. So we typically use two tools. And, and the first technique I learned is the first technique that everybody learns when they learn to pick locks. It's the one that requires absolutely no skill, or well, very, very little skill, huge amount of lock. Um, but it's dead quick and simple to learn, and you don't need to do much. So, so you take a tension wrench, torsion bar, depending on who you're talking to, which is the L-shaped bit at the bottom, and you use that to apply a turning force, and, and then you take the pointy wiggly bit, or the rake as it's known, and you sort of jam it in the lock and wiggle it around. And it, it's that simple. It's not, that, that is it. That's all you need. That's all the training. And just to prove it, if the video will play, there is a yell lock that I am raking up. So you, you put the tool in, in and out, maybe a bit of up and down. Don't twist it, don't turn it, don't bend it, because it's very thin and most planes, apart from the one that's strong in. Um, but it's, 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 it's that simple. Works works on bad locks, works less well on good locks, but you'd be surprised what you can get away with. Um, now, when, I, when I'm teaching people like proper lock picking, I describe it as like juggling, because I, I like juggling. I used to juggle when I was a kid. I can describe to you the theory of juggling in 30 seconds, and it will take you like a month of dropping balls on the floor before you can do it. So, so raking basically is the juggling, what just throwing balls up in the air is. It's like, yeah, hey, I'm juggling. Oh, no, I've stopped. Yeah, hey, I'm juggling. No. So yeah, that's it. Not, not a lot of skill to it, but it sort of works. Um, yeah, you, you feather the tension on and off as you're doing it, because you will lift the pins too high and you can drop back down. But you just wiggle it around and it opens. Sometimes. So you go, right, I, I know everything now, I know how to open locks. Brilliant, I'm done. Um, people familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect? It's a wonderful thing. I, I seem to spend my time languishing in the bottom of that. I was like, God, I know how little I know, and I know how much I don't. But of course, I, you know, I, I barely know anything. Okay, so I know one technique to open a lock, but there's other techniques to open the same sort of locks. So we have like jiggler or tryout keys, roughly key shaped bits of metal you put in and wiggle around, and surprisingly often they work. Uh, the picture on the right is one I stole from one of Skylar Towns' videos online describing overlifting. So you can, um, you can get Way for locks to open. If you put a blank key in, or a lollipop stick, or something roughly the side of a blank key, because you lift the wafers too high, they get caught up on the wrong side as they're coming back down. And if you do it right, you can get the lock open. So you know, like I say, it's a simple tricks and techniques, but but I would never have thought of that looking at it. 
And there's probably a whole world of other stuff I, I don't know about. So right, I, I need to start learning more and researching more. Ah, 15 years ago, there was an event. Um, so I used to be involved in this, this little conference thing called Uncon, um, which yeah, doesn't really do much now. But back then, it's like, right, I, I got hold of this thing called Lop Safety and Security, which is a 1,400-page book, encyclopedia, um, which is still the cheapest I can find anywhere. It's about 200 quid, so I bought a copy. But they did like an online, because they do digital versions, they did like, this free sample thing. So I found a copy of that. I, I poured over it. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant book. If you can get a hold of a copy, you do. If you get work to pay for it, even better. Um, I must get myself a copy. But, but you know, that's it. thousands of pages, loads and loads of interesting stuff. And I, I, I did this, I think it was about two hours long, the talk in the end. So I haven't got time to do it for you today. Um, but I, I went into, you know, the history of lots, all manner of, of interesting stuff. Uh, fascinating, absolutely brilliant, if you like that sort of thing. Um, a couple of points today. So, so, so this is Skylar Town. Um, a security anthropologist, as he described himself, does some amazing presentations on lock picking. Was a champion lock picker. Uh, goes into the history of a lot. His family, so so Yale, who painted the Yale Pintumbler, the company was Yale in town. He's a town descendant of. I wouldn't buy things off him on Kickstarter though. So so he had like the most ridiculously successful Kickstarter campaign. Designed some lock picks. Went to sell lock picks. Sold way more than he ever could have manufactured. Had a nightmare dealing with it. Um, but like I say, his, his stuff on history is absolutely top notch. If you want to know about the history of locks, go watch his stuff. Um, I would definitely recommend it. Um, so yeah, so I, I start digging. It's like, where can I find out information about locks? Well, one good place is the patent office. You know, you want to know about how stuff works? Well, you go and pull the patents out and they have nice descriptions and diagrams and, you know, documentation. Uh, so as an example, uh, what we've got on the left, we've got uh, the original wafer lock patent, which again is like the 18, was it 1870? And on the right, we have the first Yale pin tumbler uh, patent, which they redid in, it was about 1865. Because if you look there, originally they had it with like a, a horseshoe-shaped key before they redesigned it with the sort of flat key we typically think of now. Um, but again, you know, brilliant source of information. You want to know about stuff that happened in the past, it's, it's all documented. And then it's like, right, where can I, what else can I find out about? How do I find out about how things work? Well, like I, when I was a kid and I used to take radios and televisions and stuff apart and look at what was inside them and never get them put back together again or working, it's like, right, I'll start pulling apart every old lock I can find. So, so that's a, a random lock off, um, uh, that was off a wardrobe, I think. Um, and it's a very, very simple warded lock. So you can see the wards, those two, um, like bracket shaped things on the bottom, which is just a physical thing to stop a key turning if it hasn't got the appropriate notches cut in it. And it's a very simple lever lock. Um, so yeah, start pulling stuff apart. Like, yep, yep, more old door locks. Again, I live in an old falling down Victorian house, so we got rid of a bunch of the doors. So anything I can get, I was like, take it apart. How does it work? Look at it, try and understand what's going on. Again, make, these are horrible. Um, go, go buy cheap locks, my local DIY store. It's like, right, I take them apart, look at them, understand how they work. I, I, I want cutaways, but a very much like cutaways, you can get that easy now, getting, you know, transparent keys and perspex stuff. It's a doddle, like 15 years ago, less so. You know, cutaways were expensive if you could find them, uh, and you probably couldn't. Um, so again, let's say a cheap Dremel and a cutting disc and some cheap locks from, you know, home base or whatever, and you can start to get an idea of, right, here's how these things work. Uh, yeah, more questionable Dremel work. Uh, the, so the one on the, the, the one on the right is just, just a, a lever padlock I did. The, the one on the left taught me more about pin tumblers than anything else I've ever done. So at this point in time, I, I, I sort of knew how they worked, kind of. And it's like, right, I've got taken the old front door off, I've got this spare lock. I want to make like a cutaway because I can't afford to buy one because I'm poor and they were expensive. I'll, I'll take a lock apart. How hard can it be? I, I know what's inside there. It'll be fine. So I, I get a small pair of pliers and a screwdriver, and I managed to pry the C-clip off the back, and I had the key in it at the time, which of course meant the barrel dropped out, and like pins and springs went flying everywhere. Uh, and, and the reason it's only got three holes drilled in it, and what was originally a five-pin lock, is I could only find enough of the pins and springs to make a three-pin lock. Uh, and it does, if you turn it one way, it works fine. If you turn it the other way, it catches a bit, because the holes aren't ideal. But, but again, you know, proving the point, I can, with, with some sort of cheap tooling, I can make something that I can then show people, look, this is how a lock works. Um, and like I say, the one, the one on the right, yeah, again, uh, some, some bad work with the Dremel. Um, but you know, because I know somebody can do it better, so I, I end up with a proper one. Um, right, pin tumblers. I've mentioned pin tumblers, so I now must do what is mandatory in any lock picking talk, which is explain single pin picking. So, so raking I talked about. Raking is quick and simple and doesn't require a lot of skill and requires a lot of luck. Um, th this is juggling. So, so this is the one that I can describe the theory in like a minute, but it will take you 
hours, days, weeks of practicing to be able to do stuff. So the idea with single pin picking is that basically uh, the plugs and the cylinders for locks are manufactured to tolerances. You know, they are, they are not precise because to make them so, you know, like precision engineering would cost money and it would actually make them less usable because if they were so tightly toleranced, you know, that you've got dust and stuff in, they'd stop working. So, so they operate on tolerances. So the, the, the theory goes that like, if you look at the line of holes that are drilled into the plug, to you it appears like it's a straight line and they're all the same size, but it isn't. There are small differences in, in the size and the layout of those holes, so they're in a not a straight line. Which means when you put a turning force on the lock, one pin will stick, and only one pin. It's not all five of them, or six of them, or so, however many, like one pin will catch. So basically what you do is you feel each of the pins, and you can feel the one that's stuck. And then that's what it's showing is it's just going by pin by pin. And then when you find the one that's stuck, you move it until it reaches the shear line, which is the break between the plug and the cylinder. And when it reaches that, the lock will turn slightly, might hear a slight click, and another pin will stick. So then you feel for that pin, move that till it feel for the next one, feel for the next one. When you get the last one, it pops open. It's that simple. But the feel and the sensitivity and the touch to be able to do that will take you time to get. And again, I, I, let's say I will put my hand up. I don't practice enough anymore. You know, I, I used to practice a lot more than I do now. Um, but yeah, so single pin picking, I, I, sorry, I have to go through it, there you go. I also can't mention single pin, so you will see these, these graphics everywhere. Tool, tool use them a lot, lots of people use them a lot when they're training people out the lockpick. Uh, I believe they are the work of this man, another man I would recommend looking into his work. This is Deviant, oh, where is he, that side, that's Deviant Ollum, uh, lovely chap. Uh, so, so people know FC Freaky Clown? For, for years, me and FC were talking about, like, we're going to write a book, we're going to do a book on lockpicking, we're going to do a book on lockpicking, it'll be amazing. And because and, I'm disorganised, we never got round to it. And then he released two of them, uh, both of which are excellent books. I say, if you want a book on lockpicking, get, well, get the first one first, practical lockpicking, and then the Keys to the Kingdom next. Um, but again, you know, does lots of good videos, speaks a lot of DEF CON, that sort of stuff. If, if you want, you know, go look him up online, he's got some amazing stuff. Uh, why is this in here? Oh yeah, well, so very quick mention. So the difference, you know, difference between raking and picking. When you're raking, you're operating multiple pins at once, or wafers, or, or whatever the internal mechanism is. When you're picking, as we'll define it, you are working a single pin at a time. So you can see the differences in the tools. The one on the left are clearly designed to move lots of things at once, the ones on the right less so. So you use the right tool for the right job. Right, now just to prove, without me having to do it live, which is brilliant, because stress always messes you up. Uh, just to prove I can do it, here is me opening a four pin padlock properly. So one pin at a time, so I know this lock. So it'll be pin three, then pin four, then pin one, then pin two. So it's like literally feel it is stuck, move it, feel it is stuck, move it, feel it is stuck, move it, pop. Pop. There we go. So there you go, I can pick locks. Proof. Thank you. So again, I'm, I'm done. I know, I know how stuff works. I can open it. Brilliant. Well, but of course, that's not the case. That's never the case. So again, you know, in, interesting things that people think of that, that would have never occurred to me. People familiar with Newton's cradles, equal and opposite uh, reactions and all that sort of stuff. Uh, well, if you, if you think about a lock and, and you sort of turn it sideways, well, well, you've got like two pins next to each other. So if you smack one of those pins really hard, what does the other pin do? Well, it jumps out the way. So then you can, you know, get something like that, or better still, something like that. Uh, so, so you know, manual or electric pick gun. Uh, the idea being, you know, one you squeeze the trigger and it pops one at a time, and on the other one it just rattles back and forth. But if you can line that up and get it to hit all the pins at once, probably all the key pins at once, all the top pins will jump out the way, lock will spin open. Locksmiths swear by them. I've really struggled to use the manual one, the electric one's easier, but God, it makes a noise and a mess. Um, so, you know, if you like covert red team stuff, you might not want to think about this sort of thing. Um, but the other thing I love is, is you know, people are clever. So, so you know, whilst, um, you know, you can, you can buy a, a you know, nicely made metal thing. Uh, I believe that's like a schematic for one somebody made in prison. It's for a bit of a, you know, wire coat hanger rebent, which is brilliant. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the good old electric toothbrush. So, you know, people were taking electric toothbrushes. Well, it's electric, it vibrates. We need to vibrate a lock open. What do we need to use a toothbrush? Unless you're one of my colleagues. Uh, so a, a, a company I used to work for, uh, this is, um, this is the, the two directors. I will, I'll give you a close up. Uh, so they, they, they wandered into Ann Summers, the two gentlemen together, and they said to the girl behind the counter, we, we're looking to buy something that vibrates. 
what, what have you got that's got the most oomph? Um, <laughs> And that will look good in video, and this is what we ended up with. So they, you know, they stuck like a metal pick on the front. And okay, the, the voltage wasn't, they had to like double the batteries up so it was twice as powerful as it was supposed to be. Um, why, why we didn't sell them back, I don't know. Um, but you could, it would, it would open bad lot, you know, so that, that is like our office filing cabinets being opened. Um, yeah, you know, it, it works. It's a technique. Um, it's an interesting way of getting out of the police asking you why you've got lock picks, I suppose. <laughs> So yes, you know, you can improvise around stuff, and I, I like that about, um, you know, about this as a hobby. I, I will, I, I randomly put this in as another tangential thing. Uh, so, so, I, I kind of fell out of lock picking. So, so we built a thing that we just melt locks. So this uh, thermal lance. People familiar with thermal lances? So you, you, you use the, the steel as a fuel source. It's the steel that burns. The oxygen being fed through it just keeps it going, and, and they burn at like you know a couple of thousand degrees. You, you can melt a lot of stuff with it. It's another way. It was one of FC's silly ideas. He, he thought you could do it from like an aerosol spray can of oxygen. You know, like the ones you get for cleaning keyboards. And we were like, no, no, no. It needs proper oxygen. Um, we built the one rod, we then bought some commercial ones, so I need to get back to it. But another fun random physical project if you happen to be bored and, and don't want to pick any locks or develop skill, just, just build one of these. Um, but what other technologies exist around locks? And again, I'm, I'm going back to, you know, stuff that isn't new at all. Uh, I mean, bump keys had a resurgence a few years back thanks to, um, Chris Dangerfield at UK Bump Keys, who did a lot of work on them. But this is a patent drawing from, uh, when's it from? 1928. So again, you know, simple enough idea. Well, I mean, there's, there's some extraneous spring stuff around how it works. But very basically, you've got a key cut to specific depths. The, the key goes out a bit, you smack it in, it hits all the bottom pins, the top pins jump away, you turn the lock. And then if it doesn't work, it pops back out and you hit it again, hit it again, hit it again. Surprisingly effective if you can get keys with the right key weight to line up with, with what you're attacking. Not terribly covert. If you're trying to get somewhere in the middle of the night and you're stood there going like bang, 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 but it's, yeah, not the best. But it works. And again, it's, you know, nothing new. Uh, similarly, comb picks. People familiar with the idea of comb picks? So the, the problem with these is, um, if you look at the diagram, if you've got a pin tumbler and there are pins in the way, well, if you can lift all the pins clear out of the way, because the lock's designed badly and it has too much space in the top chamber, you, if you lift them all out of the way, nothing's holding it open anymore. Um, so again, I mean, the pin drawing from 1930s, uh, where he's got like a blank key and then he's got these things they stick in with the, the, the lifters on them. Um, but now you can buy, you know, comb picks in a range of sizes. I, I mean, I, again, I'm not a massive fan of them because I've had so many of these things stuck in locks. Like, even if locks are vulnerable to them, getting them in, getting them working is a right pain. Um, but again, you know, it's another possible technique without worrying about sort of the, the intricacies of the lock. It's like, we'll just lift it all out of the way, we'll, we'll get in. Uh, time for another introduction. Um, so this is a lovely Dutch man. How do you pronounce his name? Joss, Joss. Um, he's, he's like good at lock picking. He's very good at lock picking. He's like world champion good at. So impressioning was his thing. He was like two years running like, like, like the world champion at, at impressioning locks. So impressioning locks is making a key when you haven't got a key. So if you, if you take a blank uncut key, polish the top of it, put it in a lock, turn it one way, wiggle it up and down, turn it the other way, wiggle it up and down. It, obviously, it won't open because the pins are in the way, but by you turning it, you're clipping a pin. As you wiggle it up and down, that pin is then marking the key. You take the key out, look at it under a magnifying glass. There'll be some marks. You file them down. You put it back in. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. You end up with a copy of the key. It's amazing. He, so I, he has done locks in like under a minute from from nothing. And okay, I mean, they, they always worked on the same type of locks in these competitions. So, you know, so you get very, very good at doing one particular brand of lock. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen him do live demos when he'll be talking like this, but, but filing keys and, you know, making them work. Uh, again, I, I would heartily recommend going and looking at the stuff he does. He, he sometimes turns up at UK events. He's a, he's a really nice chap. Uh, if you see him, yeah, go, go and say hello. I say it's, um, it's clever stuff. Um, now I can, I can describe, so, hang on, slight, slight, uh, sideways step. I haven't got any files with me. I haven't got any blank keys with me, but I can show you what impressioning looks like anyway. Uh, and to do that, we're going to look at a different type of um, pin tumbler lock. Uh, tubular locks, as people mistakenly call them. Axial pin tumblers. So, I mean, again, I assume you've all seen these vending machines. You see them a lot. You know, round key with, with so you can see the exposed end of pins. But basically, it's just a normal pin tumbler like in a circle one in a line. So it's the same thing. You've got, you know, if you look, you've got a set of springs. You've got two sets of pins. You've got the shear line between the front and the back bit with the holes drilled in it. Um, 
Now, the brilliant thing about these, I, I used to love teaching people to open these. Uh, so again, you will see things that look a bit like that. Uh, people will call these tubular lockpicks. I'm a pedant, so they're not. They're actual pin tumbler impression and decoding tools. It's more of a mouthful, but it's technically correct, I think, unless anybody wants to point out that I'm wrong. And, and these are simplicity itself. So it's like literally one tool. You don't need a file. You don't need like measuring depths and, and, and magnifying and UV lights and stuff. Uh, if again, if this plays. So, box is open. Box is shut. Lock the box with a key. I marked the L and the O just so I can remember because I can never work out which was which. You, you take the front of the tool off. Uh, it's got a series of like sliding rods, so you push them all the way forward, and then you push it so they're flush with the end of the key bit. Tighten it up, put a bit of tension on. So basically it's holding those rods so they won't move very much. They'll move a bit, but not a lot. And then it's like literally you put it in the lock and wiggle it. And now I used to have a like an old steering wheel lock I used to take around with me to demonstrate this to people. And it's literally... Why does it always take longer when you're waiting for it? Oh, there we go. And it's literally, you literally put it in and turn it. That's, that is it. That is the amount of skill you need. Um, now I will, I'll, the, it goes out of focus. What it's basically going to show you is if you look at the end of the tool, you can see the little metal bits have moved down. And if you were to hold the, the real key up for it, they'll be exactly the same. And then you use a measuring key to read off what the values are. And then you go to the locksmith and say, can you cut me a key? Blah, blah, blah. And now I've got a copy of your key. Like, it's not, it's not magic. There's no rocket science involved. It's literally put it in, wiggle it. Um, you, I didn't make that joke. You all did that. That wasn't me. Stop putting that in my mind. Right. Um, so, pin tumblers, impressioning, another good attack. Uh, and, okay, squeaky files, but you can be reasonably covert with it. Uh, I know we're, we're going to get into the, the, the lock porn portion. Um, so I have a bunch of, and again, this is, sorry, this is slightly, I'm not sure why I put in the order it is. Uh, so, so I got interested in, well, well so how, it's so okay, I know, I know about pin tumblers, but what about different pin tumblers? So there was a guy, uh, what's what his name, Stephen Hampton, who wrote several books on like picking high security cylinders, um, which again, I mean, they're a bit dated now, but they're, they're fascinating reads. Um, so it's like, well, so what do they do to make locks more secure, more difficult to pick? So, can we see on this one, has this got mushroom pins? So if you look at the picture on the left, um, well, actually, on the right side, I'm just giving myself a bad neck. So you'll notice some of the top pins aren't square, they've got notches cut in them. Uh, that's to try and trip you up on your lock picking because you'll get a false bite where you think you've got it and it hasn't, it's caught one of them. But if you lift them more, it counter rotates so you can work out. It, it, if you want to know, come talk to me about it. So, yeah. But anyway, so sorry, so these are, um, wafer locks we're looking at. So, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same basically. You've got two sets of pins and a set of springs, but the key's turned on its side. You know, if, if you were to cut a slice through that key and look at it, well, you've got a profile on the edge like one the real key. It's just smaller than it would be otherwise. The interesting thing about the multi-locks are if you notice, uh, on the picture on the right, you can see, so they're not just pins, they're pins within pins. So you have an outer pin and an inner pin, so rather than just lifting one, you have to lift two. Makes it a bit more tricky. You can still impression them. I have impressioned. It, it's a nightmare because the keys are a pain to, to cut and file. But it is possible. Um, I mean, again, you can pick them. You have slightly different design picks that are, are, are curved on one side over like picks you do in a normal lock. But again, you know, a high security lock design can be more difficult to pick and people look at the whole, you know, dimple keys must be secure. Not the case. Uh, then we have the Medico. Um, this is an interesting one. So American lock that for a long time was considered to be very secure. Uh, so if you look at the key on the right, so, so if you think about a normal key, the, the cuts are like square, they're at right angles. If you look at that, the cuts are all at angles. So the thing about the Medico is not only do you have to lift the pin to the right height, you have to rotate it the right amount as well. For a long time thought completely, you know, impossible to bypass. And then a couple of, of I have a book, wrote a book year thick on, on exactly how you get past it. Not as secure as it once thought. Uh, but again, if you look, again, I'm going to give myself a bad neck. Uh, so if you look, the pins actually have a slot cut in them. Uh, and if that slot isn't lined up, there's a bar with pins that won't go into it, which you can probably see slightly clearer on the next one. So if you look on the, the screen on the right, you can see the pins are turned and there's like little uh, pins that go into it. Again, if they're not correctly lined up, none of that will move. The entire thing will be jammed solid. Um, but they were pickable eventually. 
Ah, oh, right, moving on with the history. Where did I end up next? Brumcon. So I, I did my amazing talk two hours long on Con, and it was brilliant. And then I went and did it at Brumcon, and it was an absolute disaster. So I realised that like all none of the artwork that I had, I had any copyright on at all. It was all stuff lifted from like one source. And so I tried to recreate it all manually, and, and it, it went horribly wrong. Uh, worst talk I have ever given um, by a long chalk. Uh, there was a nice guy there, though, who was pictured on the top right. Uh, anybody got London 2600? Okay, uh, Reverend Rat. Uh, I, I met him at that Brumcon like 14 years ago. I haven't seen him since. I must get myself down to 2600. Uh, he, he came and he, he said nice things to me and thanked me on the talk and he gave me this look. Uh, he then went and, and said some less pleasant things on the internet, which is fair enough. It wasn't the best talk in the world. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I, I puzzled this and puzzled this because it wasn't at the time, it wasn't like anything I'd really seen before. So, so again, you know, big hefty lock, um, flat key with, with sort of angled cuts cut in it. And I say these, these days it's delete, well, no, it's, it's a disc container lock. And, and if you buy a cheap set of see through padlocks of Amazon, you'll get one of these and, and you'll do what I did yesterday, which is put the key into it, see how it works, and it will break and lock solid and, and it's hoofed. Cheap Chinese rubbish. Um, but, but you know, it's a, it is a technology I'm more aware of now. It, the other thing is that you can get tools to attack them. So the, the thing on the right is a tool for picking a disk detainer lock, a basic simple one. I mean, for, for more advanced, more complex disk detainer locks, there are similar tools. Uh, but basically, the, the bit with the two screws going into it is where you put tension on the lock. And then if you hold the, the null bit at the back, like the bar on the end moves in and out, and you can interfere with the individual disks. Uh, I've played with this for years. I still can't get the bloody thing to open. Uh, I gave it to a professional. So sorry, I'm, I'm amateur locksmith. I, I give it to some professional lock people I know, and they can't open it either. We think it might be the, the bit on the end of the tool isn't quite the right size. Um, I had all sorts of clever ideas for like how I was going to lock inside this lock, including like a friend who worked at a dentist was going to extra it for me and stuff, but, but never got around to it. Uh, it's another one on the list of I will open this one day. Um, now, so, right, disc container locks. Think about disc container locks. They remind me of how, like, com people familiar with combination locks, like safe locks, you know, rotary combination locks, where basically you have a series of, of discs with notches cut in them, and, and the trick is manipulating it in such a fashion that all the notches line up and something can drop into them. So on the padlock on the left, it's it's that the, the ratchet rocks back if there's a gap there, and for the, the combination on the right, um, it's it's more complicated. Um, now another thing, if you look at this, there is a gaping security weakness. Uh, right where that yellow, which side? Right where that yellow circle is. Uh, so the little bit that comes out and latches into the notch on the shackle of the padlock is spring-loaded. It, it has to be because when you push the shackle shut, that's how it gets out the way. Because it's spring-loaded, that that means if we can push something against it, we, we can just push it out the way. So so you need to worry less about actually how the lock opens and, and just how the shackling mechanism works. So simple padlock shims, and you can make these with a pair of scissors and empty can of coke. You know, if you've got thin enough metal, and again, I've done it for, you know, I build like sort of CTF type things. You know, I've got people making padlock shims. To prove, they don't last long compared with like the commercially bought ones. But let's say trivial. Again, it's, you know, no rocket science, no, no hours of coding, no, no mathematical concepts to understand. It's that push a bit of metal that takes that springy thing out the way so it'll open. Uh, moving on with a bit more of the pawn. Uh, so, Disc container locks, by far the, the sort of most prevalent ones are the Abloy series. Um, I, th I think Abloy, did I buy, buy Asa? I, 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 I was at, uh, we did think at Infosec this year, um, and I was doing my usual, you know, it's like sit people down, teach them lock picking, explain stuff. And this guy, this um, uh, Scandinavian guy came over, and he's like, I'm really interested in like, how, pin, how do you break pin tumblers? And I'm like, all right, let me start with the history of it. He's like, no, no, look at the back. And so you work for Asa Abloy, right. Um, and, and, you know, within like 10 minutes, I was picking up a lot, so it was brilliant. But again, you know, like the, the the classic one they started with, the old disc lock, which had a, a weird like half moon key, so so not mirror keys. Um, but let's say in, it's a, a series of discs. Sadly, I don't have a cutaway of that one. Uh, what I do have is cutaways of a different uh, disc lock, and, and I love the engineering on these. You know, if you look at like a cheap pin tumbler, they're, they're horribly cheaply made. You, you look at these things, they are beautiful. They are, you know, very, very precise. You know, it reminds me of like watches or, or you know, that sort of thing, the, the level of detail. And the thing is, of course, normally none of this is visible at all. If somebody's cut these away so you can see the internal mechanisms, normally these are hidden away and you don't even realise they're there. But again, you've got a series of flat discs uh, with various notches cut in them. The, the key lines the notches up. The notches let a sidebar drop into that gap and then the lock will open. Uh, if they don't line up, there's no gap. The sidebar can't drop in. It won't open. 
and they have a number of like false gates. So the idea being, you know, if if your trying to feel is something dropping in place, so rather than having a full depth gate, they'll have like a shallow one cut that won't work, but you feel it and think it does. So there's a, you know a few of them to try and throw people off picking them. Uh, it, I think this is probably the most expensive lock I have. Uh, so again, this is uh, there's a ProTech two out now which they've updated the design, uh, but the ProTech was the, the the update of the disc lock. And I mean, again, the, the level, and if people want to come and have a look, I've got some of these with me afterwards, because the images really don't do it justice when you see it all moving. Um, let's say the, the level of engineering, it, I mean, you can see why they're like a couple of hundred quid a cylinder rather than, you know, like a couple of quid for a, a pin tumbler. They are, they are lovely bits of kit. Uh, so we've got more of them. Moving on in time, I did 44 con, uh, which I can summarize in two words. Uh, some of it went really well, some of it didn't. Um, yeah. Don't, don't try and open locks with paper clips. It's a ridiculous idea. Um, they are the worst tools in the world. You know, like, I'm sure you could find something better. Pad, uh, padlocks. Handcuffs, however. Everybody loves handcuffs. Handcuffs always go down a storm. There's always somebody who will make a joke about only using them in the bedroom. Guaranteed. So we'll talk about them briefly. And again, you know, handcuffs are not simple things. So there again is the original patent um, from Peerless which is only for single locking handcuffs, whereas the double locking ones we have now. Um, so if you look, sort of characteristics of padlocks, uh, you know, you've got the, the oh, I always get this the wrong way around, pole. It's the pole in the handset, the ratchet's a bit that goes into it. And like I say, modern ones will have a little, little button hidden somewhere that double locks them. So, so when the police put them in, you in them, they should double lock them to stop them tightening anymore. Because you can end up with really bad nerve issues if you over tighten the handcuffs. Um, so basically, the, the 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 double lock is just there's a little sliding bolt. So if you look, well, we have, if you look on the left, it's not in the way, and that that handcuff would open. Whereas if you look on the right, it's slid in the way, and physically it's blocking. Um, it's physically blocking the, the the ratchet from moving in either direction. Um, so again, you can't tighten them, you can't loosen them. They're, they're locked. Uh, of course, we've, we've talked about shims, shoving thin bits of metal where they're not supposed to go. Uh, if you look on the left, that is a padlock being properly opened with the correct key. If you look on the right, that is a pad, uh, sorry, handcuff being opened with no key. But, I mean, they're exactly the same. You know, the, the, the results are the same. The, the, the teeth don't mesh and, and the thing will open. Um, so from my point of view, you know, equally as good. I, I did always used to carry handcuff keys on me like, all the time. I, I, for some reason, I stopped. Another pro tip is, well, first pro tip is do not, if they please put you in handcuffs, don't take them off and give them back. It really annoys them. Um, <laughs> second, second pro tip, if you're going to carry handcuff keys, get one of the really long ones, because if you're in inflexible speed cuffs, the longer reach is a lot better. Um, but yeah. But so, so shimming, you can, you basically get, get a, um, get a, a thin bit of metal and, and you can shove, shove it in either end. The, the result is ultimately the same. And again, to save me having to demonstrate and do anything, uh, I shall show you an old video in low resolution. Um, but you know, so the handcuffs are locked. They're only really single locked, they're not double locked. This doesn't work if they're double locked. But you know, you take your thin bit of metal, you jam it down one side, you push the pole out of the way so the ratchet will open, but it catches on the last teeth, so you put it back in the other side and get those last two. Um, so putting it in that side is actually easier, but you will tend to close them a couple of clicks, so depending on how tight you're getting. Um, yeah. But anyway, handcuffs, dead easy. And I say people always like them. Uh, the other, the other awesome thing, uh, so people often ask me uh, about tools and stuff. Um, like, like, literally you can find these lying on the floor for nothing. I mean, we saw a couple of street, street sweepers out this morning. See, you know, the little carts that drive around cleaning the roads with those brushes. Those brushes actually have sprung steel heads. So you'll find the blades snap off all the time. You will literally just find them lying in the gutter. They are really good sprung steel. They're, um, what, they're like half mil by three mil. Um, they might need a bit of cleaning up, they might be a bit rusty, um, but let's say they, they make um, they make really good shims for handcuffs especially, but also like, if you want to make picks, they're, they're really good quality metal for pick making out of. Um, like I say, it doesn't work if they're double locked, so if, if they've double locked them, well actually we might have some use for a paper clip after all. Um, so, so again, the, the one useful thing we worked out, if you have a paper clip and a pair of handcuffs stuck on you, and you shove the paper clip, straighten the paper clip out and shove it in the hole, like the keyhole, till it hits the back. And then you bring it forward like half a millimetre and bend it at right angle. That's about the perfect length. So the one on the bottom of the right is, is sort of roughly it. And you can, you can get them open. Um, I mean, even if it's just taking the double lock off. Um, so okay, yeah, I, I, paper clips do have some uses um, occasionally. 
but I still rather have the key. Uh, what else did we do? Besides 2012 in London, so again I got asked to go and do a bunch of lock picking, sit and teach people. The first time I ever had a lock pick broken. Uh, that, that was, um, I, I, I shall name and shame, my, my, my colleague Barry Miles was teaching somebody and she snapped one of my picks. I've, I, I used to keep like copies of broken picks and take pictures of them and, and then I started like, teaching people a lot. So I basically I have my lock picks that I use and then I have the ones that I let everybody else use. And they are horribly mangled. The things people, you know, you tell people it's, you don't need to use a lot of force. It's like finesse, gentle, it's a bit, sk and you see them in there like levering stuff. And it's, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's audible. Um, but as I say, which is why I have mine that nobody else touches. Uh, oh, then a funny story. Are, are people familiar with the manufacturer of Mad Bob? Yeah, so, sorry about that. Um, so, so a very, very good friend of mine, uh, who was, I mean, I've known him for, God, as long as I've lived where I live, pretty much. Uh, and he used to make Formula One cars for a living. Um, but both him and his dad worked for a, a Formula One team, manufacturing, fabricating stuff. Um, and that, that job had finished, and he, he was building custom motorbikes for a living. But I knew he had a load of um, sheet titanium. And I wanted some titanium tools made, because at the time it was a big thing. Bo Bogotars were the big thing, which is a particular design of lockpick with three peaks. Um, and everybody was going, oh, like, titanium bogatars, titanium bogatars. And, and there was an American firm that sold them, but it was silly money. So I'm like, right, you've got some sheet titanium. Can you make me a set of these things? And he's like, what are they? And I'm like, well, I showed him them. I'm like, what are they for? Well, they're for opening locks. Why do you want to open locks? So I sat with him in the pub. And for about an hour and a half, I sat and went through how locks work, how you lock. And he's like, right, yeah, no, brilliant. I'll, I'll, I'll go away and I'll, I'll work on something. So that's awesome. So I saw him the next day. I'm like, have you made my titanium bogatars? He's like, no. Brilliant. What? He's like, I've made this. So he had sat overnight um, in his workshop, and he had basically handmade from scratch uh, a jackknife, which was the first thing he started selling. Um, he now has had considerable success, although, again, the issue is he's trying to compete with like mainstream manufacturers. He, he handmakes everything. He can't compete, really, because um, people expect you to have the same throughput and, and stuff as they do and don't understand. Um, but so now we, we occasionally bull around, so that was, uh, I think that was at the first steel con. And again, we go and do, like, bring a bunch of locks, sit down and, and teach people how to pick stuff. Uh, and again, you can have a variety of you know, combination locks and lever locks and all sorts of stuff. Uh, what else did I get into? Then I started looking at games for hackers, which is a nightmare, because they're bloody awful. Because nobody reads the instructions or does what you want them to, and they never follow the simple clues you leave them. Uh, but no, I, I was lucky enough to, to be invited a number of times to attend a particular event. Um, and I have made a couple of challenges for them, which have been really good fun. Although time consuming and expensive and soul destroying. Oh, well, no, so actually that, that, that came out all wrong. I retract that. The trouble is, because I'm precious about my stuff, and typically I will have a lot of stuff that there's only one of, and if anybody breaks it, that's going to ruin it for the entire event. So I don't get to take part in the entire event. I will sit and watch people do my job. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for them to mess up. Uh, but uh, it's always good fun, except I always mess up and I'm never ready in time and I always spend like the first night of the event when everybody else is out drinking, like putting locks together or taking them apart or recreating from scratch the stuff I forgot to put in the car before I came. Um, but it's handy and it, it taught me a very useful new skill, which is repinning. So, you know, I talked about earlier when I took that first pin tumbler apart and it went everywhere and it was a nightmare and I ended up putting it back together like the picture on the left. So I had some matchsticks so it's like, get a spring in, get a pin in, hold it in place with a matchstick, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and then try and load the plug back in while sliding the matchsticks out one at a time. Stupid way of doing things. I, I have turned it into a game since, though. So now when I run these CTF-type things, it's like, right, here's a matchbox with a challenge for you. Put that back together using only what's in the matchbox. Now, which I say, on your own is an absolute nightmare. If you've got helpers, it's not so bad. Um, but I have the tools to do it properly now. So it's, you know, taking lots apart is, is a doddle. Um, it's a useful skill to have because... <clears throat> Excuse me, because I now have progression, so I can I can build a bunch of locks, and I can have like a one pin lock, two pin lock, three pin lock, four pin lock, five pin locks, you know, with safety pins, without safety, uh, sorry, sec <clears throat> security pins in, um, and it means I can build silly things for you know competitions and games. But again, you know, useful skill to have. You know, it's not very costly. You need a few specialist tools, not a lot. Uh, oh, I'm an idiot. I'm an absolute idiot. So I was working on these slides at 3am, uh, and I wanted to cut and paste some of the pictures that are in that document, which is a thing I wrote for one of the challenges I did, because there were some pictures I want to show you, 
and they're sat on my machine at home. And I didn't put them on the pen drive I bought with all the pictures on. But what I did have was an old presentation with copies of the PDFs. Well, not like screenshots of the PDFs, not copies. So I apologise. I would like to show you some higher res pictures, but I don't have any with me because I'm an idiot, as I mentioned. Um, but yeah, lever locks again. Well, different, different levels of complexity, but the idea of opening them, basically simple ones. So the tools on the top left, uh, you know, like we use two tools for a, a pin tumbler, for lever locks, we use two tools the same. So we have one to try and um, move the bolt, and then we have another to interfere with the levers. And again, I shall show you a quick video, which I apologize, my hands get in the way for most of this, and I'm clearly using a cutaway because I'm rubbish at this, but I just wanted to demonstrate what it should look like. Um, it was funny, this, the, the challenge I did for this, one of the locks they had to get through was that cutaway, but I wrapped green tape around it. The idea being, well, they can just take the tape off. Only about half the team's bothered, so it was interesting to see that are they gonna, are they gonna play with it as is, covered up? Because it's like, you know, you'll get the point, you're not gonna lose anything. But again, it's interesting how people approach stuff. And again, it's a nightmare writing these sort of games, because, you know, you think, oh, people do it like this, and then they go off massively on tangents. Um, but there you go, so, so, you know, simple lever locks. Uh, I then, so, so, let's see, I, I collect high security locks. Uh, this, this is a beautiful thing. It's, uh, Oh, I forget the manufacturer. It's, it's off a safety deposit box. It's, I think, 16 levers. So, you know, if you think your sort of mops lock at home might be five, uh, that's 16. Again, it's a fun challenge because invariably you take the case off so people can see the internal workings and you hand it to them like, oh, that's pretty. And then they turn it over and all the insides fall out. <laughs> I have put that thing back together so many times. So that's now my challenge. You give it to people in bits and say that, right, can you put that back together, please? Uh, right, we're winding up. So we're getting there. I, a friend sent me a picture of the lock on the left. He said, yeah, my, my window lock's opening. You, you got anything for these? And it's, oh, I just happened to have the same ones. And I thought they were like little wafer locks or maybe even like basic pin tumblers. I've locked in that thing. I can't even work out what it's doing. I mean, it clearly does something. But the thing I'm jamming into it is a, a bit of um, a windscreen wiper blade. So if you take an old windscreen wiper off, peel the rubber away, there's a long strip of steel, which has got a couple of notches in the end. And so they literally stick it in, wiggle it around. Again, not a lot of rocket science. Whilst we're criticising locks and the American government, um, so TSA approved locks. I love this. This is terrible. The worst wafer lock you've ever seen, plus an awful combination lock. So if you get bored of picking it open, you can you know mess with the combination stuff. Terrible. And of course, the keys have been printed online freely, so you can just download the keys and make your own security. Yeah, in a brilliant. Uh, other things I've been looking at recently. Does anybody on their homes have, have one of the things pictured on the left? T take it off, throw it away. You're probably invalidating your home insurance. <laughs> but seriously, they are so easy to open. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, hit it with a hammer, it will break anyway. But you can open them in about 30 seconds with a feeler gauge. Uh, lots of people have them on, like, you know, holiday homes and stuff. Now, see, I, I've been advised that, that you may be invalidating your warranty. Uh, sorry, your warranty, your, your insurance, like if you left a key outside, because that's what you're doing. Uh, the things on the, the right... Uh, again, I assume people probably get them all over office spaces and stuff. Uh, again, equally rubbish. Uh, you, you apply some tension to it, you feel the buttons, the ones that stick, you let the tension off and push them, and then you repeat that about three times and the lock opens. Um, and I had, oh, it's brilliant. I ran a, I ran a training course for a week. We, so we do in, at work, like, you know, sort of, um, entry level type technical pen testy type courses. And I had a couple of my, my international colleagues sent over. It was, it was frankly beneath them. They were, they were well experienced. They knew everything that was going on. So I, I didn't teach them a lot during the week in terms of like the cyber thing. Um, but one day we had to move rooms and the room we went to had been left locked with one of these. And so I stood there for 30 seconds and opened it and they were more impressed than I've ever seen them before. But like I say, they're, 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 they're absolutely trivial. I, oh, and, and my friend Major Tom, who taught me both of those. Um, and again, this is, you know, the thing is, it's, it's, you know, find interesting people who know stuff and get them to tell you. Uh, the other thing I've been looking at, and we're very, very nearly done, uh, these, these are brilliant because they're so bad. Uh, so again, Airbus, um, 145, 155, and 165 series combination padlocks. Um, because of some flaws they've got in them, uh, you can basically very easily work out if you've got, so, so they have false gates every two numbers. Uh, so, so numbers are either going to be odd or even, but you can very easily work out when you've got them in the right orientation, if not the correct number. So basically you're taking like 10,000 possible combinations and dropping it to like 5 by 5 by 5 by 5, which is a considerably smaller number. But then because you can feel the false gates, um, you can actually open them a damn sight easier. Um, and again, you know, well known, not, not a new technique, but, but useful to practice and play around with. Um, and 
I'm running out of steam and time. So, damn it, I'm colour blind. What colour's that? <laughs> yeah, no, red, green, colour blind. Is that, that green or red? Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I said I would come here and, and talk about some history. I, I do a bit of science, but not a huge amount. I tell some stories, funny or not, and I show you some pictures. Um, and yeah. I think that's me. Any questions? Oh, I have got stuff. If people want to come and catch me outside and have a look at some of this, I've got stuff with me. Uh, yeah, questions, comments, abuse. Oh, not you. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, then. It's a tough question, actually. I teach my kids how to Yep. I wish I'd learned at that age. It's like we were talking about gymnastics earlier. It's, it's you know, I wish I'd learned. Uh, I have some slides that aren't in this one. So, so I want. So I, I have a lot of picking one hundred and one T-shirt that I wear a lot, which has a picture of like a cat burger on the front. And some I was once done a petrol station, and this this elderly gentleman accosted me. I was like, "That's a disgrace. You're a disgrace. All you're doing is teaching burglars. How how dare you? That's there's no good use for that." And it's well, what industry do we work in? We, we are security professionals. How do you improve security by testing it, by showing people it's broken, by showing people it doesn't work? Locksmiths for centuries have had this stitched up. They won't tell anyone. It's all secret. Nobody knows how bad it is. And it is bad. We're making the world a better place. The only way you improve things is by highlighting issues. The only way you know about issues is by testing for them. Like, what's their problem? Punch them. <laughs> what, to, to get... To get past, to get past it, or what, so I, I get another another frequently asked question: Should I put good locks on my house? Is Andy here somewhere? Uh, um, no, but buy the cheapest locks that your home insurance will accept. Otherwise, you're wasting money, and you're highlight maze and attacker that you have something worth stealing. So my house has terrible locks. I have a dog that will chew your face off <laughs> if you get past the misses. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say. It, it, all you're doing, you know, it's like put cameras on your place, brilliant, you're telling me you've got stuff worth nicking. Put expensive locks on your place, compare with your neighbours, I now know where the money is. Uh, yeah, get the cheapest locks your insurance will accept. Like, kite marked, British standard, don't, don't waste money. I mean, buy, buy them for your own interest, have them internally or play around with them. But like I say, as an actual security measure, it's, you know, a burglar is not going to pick a lock. He's going to smash a window or cut a hole in the roof or, you know, kick a door in. So, so my car got broken into in London. I had about two and a half grand worth of lock picking stuff in the boot and a camera. They lifted the camera, they left the lockpicking here, because thieves have no interest in lockpicking. Why would they want to spend months or years developing a skill when they can use brute force? But yeah, not say it. it's an indicator to me if you've got stuff worth nicking, don't don't do it. Buy a big dog. It's a better plan. Yes. No, not you, especially not. No, so, I, we used to teach a lot of police people, like National High Tech Crime Unit people, uh, from advice I have been given. Okay, if, if you are in an area behaving oddly with lockpicks, where there have been a range of burglaries with lockpicks and no evidence left behind, th then they might have issue. I mean, I, I, I've got lockpicks on me. I always have lockpicks on me. You know, I've taken them through airports. I've taken them on planes. I take them. I, I once got stopped. They once got picked up on x-ray. Uh, they were stuck down the back of my briefcase. I've forgotten about them. And they're like, what are these? I'm like, oh, they're, they're um, tools for the laptop. Yeah, all right. But again, I mean, my, my friend Sophia was flying abroad recently, and it's sat, you know, in, in like the airport picking locks. No, what are you doing? I'm picking lots. All right. Um, I mean, that's, I, 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 used to, I, I used to work for a very large bank, and I would be sat waiting for my customer in like, the bank's reception, sat picking lots, and people would be, what the hell is he doing? But no, as, as far as I'm aware, let's say, unless, you know, if you're acting suspiciously around a property that's not yours, then, it, yeah, you're, you're arguably going equipped. I, I, let's say, it's not, it's not a problem I've ever had. Um, but then I suppose I do have this job. Um, but let's say, you know, as, as, as far as I'm concerned with the legal advice I have had from serving policemen, you should be all right. I mean, don't go like stabbing people with them. Um, <laughs> unless they really deserve it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> 
Oh, this is being recorded, isn't it? Uh, so as, as a beginner, the, the, the best advice I can give to people is, is like, don't spend a lot of money because you might hate it. You might not, it might not be a thing for you. Start off with a cheap set. The best advice I can give you is get some like fine sandpaper and polish them. Take any rough edges off. Because the, so the reason that like loops are so popular, sorry, mad bobs are so popular is because the amount of finish he puts in them and, and the amount of, of work he puts into making sure they are like mirror polished. Because like I say, any, any little rough edges will snag when you're doing stuff. So yeah, by, by all means, buy a cheap set to start with before you go and buy expensive sets. Um, but like I say, a bit of sandpaper, take care of them, polish them up. Um, I mean, practice. Practice is the main thing. I mean, and again, you know, you can do it cheap. You can find bits of Street Sweeper Blade and get a file and make your own picks. Um, you know, I mean, some would argue it's better because you're making your own tools and you know better how they work. Um, but no, let's like say, I, I, I'm for, for, for sort of beginners, it's like get, get yourself a basic set. Don't buy a set with like 300 picks that you'll never use. I mean, I, I basically learned to pick with a half diamond and pretty much now all I ever use is a rake or a half diamond. You know, there's no point having like a 50 pick set because you're just paying for bits of metal you'll never, you know, you'll never do anything with. Uh, the, the, I mean, the better thing is get get locks, get lots of locks. You know, go to car boot sales, go to, like bring and buy sales, anywhere you can find people selling secondhand stuff. Get on eBay and find old locks, or you know, get yourself down to local DIY store. I mean, that's what I did when I started. You know, go and buy like half a dozen padlocks and a bit of chain, put them on the chain, and sit and take them off the chain and put them back on again. Um, but like I say it, it's the practice thing. You know, if, if if you are if you are well practiced, even with bad tools, you'll do all right. I say my issue now is I I don't practice. I'm old. I'm getting arthritic. Um, yeah. But I say sandpaper. Yeah, buy, buy cheap tools, but like look after them well. Don't expect them to be good when you get them out of the packet. Um, let's say put the effort in, and it should reward you. Anyone else? No. Superb. So everybody, put your hands together.